Hey space fans, uh, today we're going to take a look at a few different things. Um, I got a nice big giant space station here for you, and it's powered by a black hole, or quantum singularity, and it's got an AI core and a construction drone and lasers times four and a backup generator and power transmission and big giant towers to store rocket parts and huge radiators and a warp drive so it can float into space it's just all sorts of all sorts of cool um so what we're gonna do with it is basically we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and and climb that kardashev scale uh, except it's kerbal space program so we couldn't possibly actually like do it for real um we're gonna have to you know scale it down a little so um it's not going to be the carter shed scale it's going to be the, the kerbal shed scale we'll call it <laughs> um i think that would be kind of kind of cool so we'll, we'll call it the the kerbal shed scale um and yeah so what we're going to do is we're going to take this here power plant and we're going to float it up into space using beamed power we've already got some satellites in orbit um, this station's actually already orbiting Minmus. I just kind of reloaded a, a fresh one here just to show you how it launches. Um, but basically, uh, you know, you got your, your beams there. Um, network efficiency is pretty good. It's like 81%, um, which is respectable. Um, they're both, both stations are pumping out the same wavelength, uh, so to speak. Um, it's like one picometer or something like that, a micrometer. Um, but they're definitely putting out different uh, levels of power, um, so we're getting a different amount from each one. Um, but you can kind of see their, you know, the aperture size as well as the spot size based on distance. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so let's go ahead and turn the uh, exotic matter all the way up. Uh, this will take a moment to charge, and just to be absolutely certain that we're doing the right things here, um, I'm going to go ahead and check our power usage and yeah all right so quick adjustments here let's go ahead and check there yeah we're, we're see the tri-alpha backup generator i um, forgot to start that one disabled so let me go ahead and turn that off um, we could you know just add that to the pool and and use the power from that too but just kind of wanted to show you um that uh, in general this thing will just float right on up into space um, the backup generator not necessarily needed to get it to space or to ignite the singularity since we can use beam power for that um, but it's always good to have a backup so you know those tri-alphas are really great when you're at the end of the tech tree and can do that uh, so let's go ahead and now that we're charged up we're going to just go ahead and float up bring up our power usage window one more time and there we go Okay, um, just using micro, um, the uh, beamed power there uh, from our couple satellites in space. And we are lifting a vessel that weighs 419 plus uh, tons, <laughs> 420,000 kilograms, um, is pretty cool. Um, so there's the radiators folding up so that they don't uh, break apart. And yeah, um, so same same as any other average everyday anti-gravity launch into space. You just kind of float it on up there, um, time accelerate, have a cup of tea, something like that. We're not going to follow this entirely thing, though. We're, we're just going to go ahead and go to the one that's already there. Um, so yeah, once you're up there, you ship some rocket parts to it, and then you start building things. Um, with uh, What we're using is the extra planetary launch pads. Um, so that we can have you know some stuff in space uh, being built goes great with interstellar extended because you know when you're out there exploring interstellar space you're probably going to want to set up some bases that can um, produce their own goods and ships and stuff and repairs as opposed to having things flown out all the time even though with a warp drive i mean you, you could but then you put a warp drive on the station and then that's that's the real deal right there because you know and then you got mobility. All right, so this ship, um, it's a lot of a lot of cargo, a lot of transport. Uh, it's basically, um, sorry, there's a, I, I, I pre-recorded this and then recorded my voice over top of it because I forgot my microphone again. Um, but basically, um, this ship right here, it's gonna go ahead and uh, transport liquid fuels um, such as 
there's our positron reactor right there uh, it's going to provide uh, thrust um, there you got a little bit of storage got your um, atmospheric scoops uh, but yeah uh, as far as the storage goes you know it's uh, liquid hydrogen nitrogen oxygen water deuterium helium 3 and then there's like a lithium and boron container on there as well um, so all sorts of goodies for the uh, the late game there um, as far as cheap easy to gather uh, fuel sources um, so right now we're, we're going to go ahead and fill up our tanks uh, using liquid hydrogen uh, from one of our little tugboats there i uh, had a little issue with cross feed there but it wasn't too big of a deal um, so what we do first is use our refrigerator to um, well, first we filled up on liquid hydrogen and then locked that. Then we use our refrigerator to expand uh, some of the hydrogen gas as well so that we can have some monopropellant as well as thrust propellant uh, using just a teeny tiny amount of hydrogen. Uh, once this thing gets to wherever it wants to go to harvest, uh, I can run off of a variety of fuels using the uh, Crusader thermal rocket. So all sorts of options for fuels. We don't really need much um, to get started. Quick back and forth vessel switch to get the portraits to load. There's their pretty faces. Okay, and we're upside down. Great. Let's go ahead and puff ourselves away a little bit. Get a nice little view of that. I think I, I was kind of going for like a Talati vulture look for this ship um, in as much as I can with you know, the, the parts available with Kerbal Space Program. I suppose if I did some sort of procedural wings thing, P-wings or something, I could do some holes to make it look authentic. But this is the Kerbal version of the Talati Vulture and a uh, Talati slash Argon um, trading post, docking port, something like that. Docking port. It's not really a shipyard in the X3 sense, but it's definitely a shipyard in the Kerbal sense. Um, but I, I thought, you know, kind of give it a little bit of a Talati look from the X uh, series there. Uh, obligatory barrel rolls. But, uh, yeah, as far as the back, I was kind of going for a little bit of a Firefly look. I don't know if you're familiar with that series, but I really wanted those fins to rotate independently of the vessel. But I couldn't get it to get, be stable um, and, and produce the cool spinny effect that I wanted. So I'll keep working on that. Um, but for now, we got a, a static... Um, set on there. Alright, so let's go ahead and turn around so we can eject that engine cover. Wouldn't want to smash it into the station there. Um, that, that would be bad. <laughs> There's a lot of antimatter on that thing. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, the Singularity, by the way, produces a ton of antimatter, so that's um, as well as positrons. Um, positrons and antiprotons, so this thing is running on positrons since they're currently so cheap um, thanks to that Singularity. All right, there goes the, the engine cover, and looking good. Let's go ahead and test this thing out and pick a target. Um, Jewel. Oh yeah, before we do that, um, I noticed on here the receivers that I put on here. Um, I didn't quite arrange them correctly. Like they look okay, like that. Um, that looks decent enough. But since they rotate, if I roll the vessel, um, they actually correct themselves and then they clip right into the atmospheric scoops and that looks weird so I should have offset them a little maybe by 45 degrees um, or put like some hinges in there or something so that it didn't look like that uh, so that sucks um, I'll work on that design a little bit <laughs> um, try to make this thing a little bit better um, but we'll, it will just fold those up and pretend like they're not there Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you might see a few other parts on there that are unfamiliar, like that big blue ball up there and a few other things, but um, just try to ignore those. All right, let's go ahead and head on to Jewel. Star trekking across the universe, boldly going forward because we can't find reverse. Star trekking across the universe. On the Starship Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Okay, so suddenly a wild object appears. Uh, it's a big old planet. Oh, well, it's not a planet, it's a moon called Pole. Uh, so it's uh, kind of in the way of Jewel, of us getting to Jewel. It's like, you shall not pass. And we're like, okay, bud, we're just going to go around. 
you be you. So, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> we, we just go around. Just figure, why not, right? There's jewel right there. We'll just zip around and point at it, and we'll be on our way, right? Well, unfortunately, we run into a slight issue. So, we line ourselves up, all sorts of confident, start charging, we're like, yes, glorious, glorious charge, and then, to our dismay, we are too close to pull <laughs> to activate warp. Um, so that's, you know, that, that was less than ideal, and I figured, you know, okay, we'll just go around, and then suddenly, you know, as we're adjusting our orbit and thinking we're just going to you know, power up on the other side and, and zip away, we don't realize, like, how close we are to the planet, so we kind of take a look, and uh-oh, this is not good. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna crash. We gonna crash, and we still can't get away, and yeah, so we're like, okay, uh, how much fuel do we have? Like, can we, can we do this with engines? <laughs> um, so, remember, we, we put a teeny tiny bit of hydrogen in our refrigerator, so we have like less than 300 units, like something like 200 units. Where, where are they at? Oh yeah, it's the smallest one. Yeah, 200-ish units, like 220 or something like that there. So we burn it, burn it like our lives depend on it, and it gets us just barely above the surface, 3.1 kilometers, 3106. And so we're like, okay, we're, we're not going to die, not today. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we start the warp drive, and uh, yeah, just kind of increase our our periapsis a little bit more using anti gravity while it charges, and it's gonna be a minute before we're we're actually able to to zip away. So I do apologize for this part. You can just kind of fast forward a little. We're just gonna rotate around the planet there a little bit after we fail a few times to. To warp away. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that your vessel is strong enough to escape um, if you're super close to the planet or avoid getting so close um, when you're, you know, most of your transportation is provided by the warp drive. Um, you could have, you know, alternatively, I could have just put a massive engine on this thing that would have been able to, you know, escape pull uh, pretty easily. But um, if I don't know if you're familiar with the X universe or not, but generally the ships in there are monstrously underpowered as far as um, the engines on them. Like, you sit there and you got an engine that's just like cooking, you know, nonstop for a week, and you're only like moving 130 meters per second relative to things around you. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> um, so a little bit unrealistic there in X. So to to kind of do that, I just put like woefully underpowered but highly efficient engines um, on these things so you know not a lot of fuel required it can burn for a really long time on a decent amount of fuel but ultimately not the most powerful things in the world uh, most of the transportation is done through warp and now that we're free uh, we can go ahead and continue our mission on to jewel to harvest some of that sweet sweet green atmosphere I wonder what it tastes like some consider Jewel to be more of a tapioca, um, could be more of a lime, maybe a, a lime meringue kind of thing, I don't know. Uh, but certainly we are going to scoop some up and find out. Definitely the Kerbals there, super overjoyed that they have escaped certain death by smashing into one of the moons of Jewel, and they are happily light speeding their way along to the massive gas giant to perform their mission. Okay. Now then, save for quick and should drop out of warp. Um, okay. Note to self, double check that auto circularize orbit is on. I was pretty sure it was on, um, but I may have just approached at a really odd angle, so that's 
stems the brakes. Yes, yeah, that was that was bad. <laughs> that was those poor Kerbals. They uh, well through the the magic of quick save though, we'll we'll be okay. We'll just go ahead and and reload those guys. <laughs> Hey, what's that uh, timer counting down there? What does that mean? Could be important. Oh. That's probably not good for Jewel. I wonder what would actually happen to a gas giant if that much antimatter were detonated that close to, it, like, inside of its atmosphere. I imagine really bad things. <laughs> Possibly turn the thing into like a star or something, just ignite the whole outer solar system. Maybe have a donut shaped star that just collapses inward and consumes all the inner planets in the sun, and then we have some kind of big sweeper. I don't know. It would probably be pretty devastating, but we're just going to go ahead and reload and avoid that apocalyptic scenario completely. Alright, cruising back at eight times the speed of light. We'll go ahead and go around poles a long way this time so that we don't uh, have to deal with that. And let's see, drop out around 2.5 um, million meters. So we're gonna have to get closer, much closer. All right, without, without disintegrating. Definitely want to do this sans disintegration. And very gently easing on down the road. Easing on down the road. Okay, we're not dead. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. So now that we are just barely above the atmosphere of Jewel, we're not even in the atmosphere. Thank goodness. We're about 20 to 30 kilometers up, 34 kilometers up uh, above the atmosphere. But there's still plenty of material at this height uh, for us to turn on um, our vacuum scoops and. Uh, Collect some some atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, so the the actual atmosphere jewel starts at about two hundred thousand, um, and definitely we would encounter a little bit of turbulence at that point uh, that might rip us to shreds. We might be able to survive it, also, but you never know. Uh, so just to be safe, we're going to go ahead and do this this particular extraction above the atmospheric line. It's definitely going to be a lower, um, it's not going to be as efficient, it's going to take longer, but it's a big planet. We got a tight orbit, we got all day, and we have time acceleration. All right, so liquid deuterium, liquid helium-3, um, and hydrogen are things that we can harvest from this particular body, as you can see there. Um, not so much for the water, nitrogen, or oxygen, so those tanks are going to stay empty, but you can see we're already getting you know, a good supply of hydrogen uh, going on. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little bit's filling up in there, but not so much on the uh, parts that we would not expect to find in this particular atmosphere. I suppose I could change those to all collect hydrogen. Um, that would be an option. You can change uh, the order that they're in, so you can you can definitely always switch them um, in flight. So it's definitely a modular system that you can uh, rearrange. Just takes a little bit of a little bit of right click menu action, and and you can rearrange um, you know how your vessel goes using those particular tanks. Um, those I believe are from the interstellar fuel switch mod or they might just come with Interstellar Extended itself. I really recommend using Interstellar Fuel Switch with Interstellar Extended. If you're not using both of them at the same time, you're really uh, limiting um, you know, the, the flexibility of your vessels um, because you know, you have so many fuels to choose from, it's really nice to be able to switch the function of a tank in flight. Just If it's similar materials, why not store similar materials in the same kind of tank? Save space instead of having a bajillion of them. You just have, what do I have on here? 14 total. Uh, which is still a lot, but I wanted this thing to carry a lot. Okay, so um, you know, preliminary tests show that we're, we're definitely collecting, and these um, particular atmospheric scoops, um, they run at about 
20 megawatts each um, at their current size. So they take about 40 megawatts total to run both of those. Um, so it's really not, I mean, it can be a lot if you're early on in the game and don't have quite those powerful reactors. Um, but once you get, you know, a steady supply of power and you can maintain 40 megawatts without issue, uh, you can harvest so much, or even 20 megawatts and just use one, or just use a refrigerator and, and use a little bit. Um, but definitely, um, you know, these, these, these things are super useful. And they look cool. <laughs> All right, so there's, you can see 40 megawatts is what we're using. Close those up. And then we also have an extra refrigerator, so we can do even more extraction if we wanted to, but um, I think I would need to put more air intakes on here. Um, yeah, definitely putting more air intakes will increase the amount of atmosphere you collect at once, so that's, that's a thing. All right, so we time accelerate, and now we're full on hydrogen in the tanks that hold hydrogen didn't take long at all. Oh yeah. All that fuel. Good stuff. Good stuff. And now, of course, we could use all of that fuel as propellant if we wanted to or needed to. Or we could just deliver it. Um, so let's deliver it somewhere. Where where would we possibly, let's see, what's out there? Mm, where do, what do you think? Let's take it to, uh, who knows? Okay, so make sure we turn everything off. We wouldn't want to leave the oven on. Let's see, yep, off, there we go. Good stuff. So it was at two, two point two hour, two hours twenty minutes um, there, from launch, um, from the station to get to Jewel, and then do some maneuvering and collecting and that sort of thing. I think each one of those holds like one or two tons, maybe one and a half tons. So it's quite a good um, tonnage there of hydrogen. You can get a little bit of extra in the refrigerator. So now to choose a destination. Could take it back to Kerbin, but that's boring. Let's take it to Duna. Yeah, sounds good. Alrighty charge up that drive super fast good stuff and away we go oh yeah probably should have checked that flight plan first we just dove right into the atmosphere at um, I think a hundred or so of the speed of light uh, actually held up a lot better than I thought quality made vessel working as intended Hold, holds up to extreme stresses <laughs> Uh, fairly decently. Unfortunately, though, our only means of escape has disintegrated and the other, um, the engine fell off. So these gribbles are doomed. Doomed, 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 doomed. Um, just double check here if I can possibly self destruct that antimatter container. Negative. No control. Well, no early outs for you guys. Okay, so once again, we're going to use the magic of quick load uh, because. Apparently, I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near a spaceship. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, so sad. Okay. Um, maybe we should try to harvest something a little safer, a little closer to home. Maybe somewhere where the Kerbals would have a chance of parachuting out if a similar situation occurred. <laughs> And that somewhere is going to be Kerbin. So let's go ahead and tighten up our orbit there. Get super duper close. Yay, super close. Okay. Um, for this one, though, um, we are actually going to dip into the atmosphere. 
Um, so we can, you can see we, we're getting a little bit way up here at 100,000 meters, but we want a lot more than that because that's, that's pitiful amounts. Pitiful, pitiful amounts. Just teeny tiny amounts. All right, so we're going we're gonna to adjust our orbit here in two seconds. Take a look. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Good enough. Okay. We'll go that way. Forgot we were orbiting, uh, <laughs> um, which one call it clockwise instead of counterclockwise. <laughs> e -dee 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 -dee. Okay. Um, now again, since we reloaded, we're starting off again with that 200-ish units of hydrogen, so not exactly a lot to burn, but definitely had plenty to do what we needed to do. And we'll just go ahead and time accelerate down to the thicker upper atmosphere. Or the, well, okay, that sounds weird. Um, above the atmosphere curve and you, or other planets with an atmosphere, you can still harvest the materials. It's just very thin. Um, so we're going to dive into Kerbin so we can get some appreciable uh, returns here. Um, yes, there is drag. Um, it's going to slow me down um, and degrade my orbit, uh, decay my orbit as I do this. But we have plenty of um, velocity to and uh, power to get back out again, so it's no big deal. All right, so th what we're harvesting from Kerbin with our current tanks, uh, nitrogen, um, oxygen, and liquid water, and carbon monoxide, or carbon dioxide. Actually, it doesn't look like we're getting water. We should be getting water. Why aren't we getting water? You know what? I think what we should do is switch our tank up, and then there. Okay, now we're getting water. So I just switched the tank over so that we have liquid water and water. So we're collecting water and then liquefying it into liquid water. Um, and then now we're collecting uh, those three uh, main resources. And also a little bit of deuterium um, can be collected from carbon. So teeny you know, micro milligrams worth of, of deuterium can be collected from the upper atmosphere of carbon. It's good stuff. So you can see the relative uh, ratios, proportions, if you will, of the materials that you would collect all the way in the back. So the big ones, the nitrogen, middle ones, oxygen, and then on the far left is going to be water. So um, you can kind of see the uh, relative proportions as far as quantities that you'd expect to collect. Definitely going to get mostly nitrogen. <laughs> um, so, you know, good stuff. And then when you're done collecting, you can just put your apoapsis and periapsis back above the atmosphere so that you don't, um, you know, crash off screen or something. <laughs> Right, so full tank of nitrogen and not full on oxygen or water, um, but definitely filled up on nitrogen super duper fast. All right, so once you got all those things collected, deliver it somewhere, you know, dock it to a space station or something like that. So we're here around Duna, and we're docked to a, a vessel that looks similar to one that I used in uh, Project Star Forge. Um, a lot of the same principles, um, except this one's not using the muon catalyzed fusion reactor, and it's not right next to the frickin' sun. Um, instead, it's also powered by positrons, since I have an abundance of them currently, <laughs> and uh, beamed power, and it also functions as a relay. So one of those antennas is geared for infrared, or near infrared rather, and the other is um, calibrated for near ultraviolet. Uh, so we can collect one and then convert it to the other uh, for use at long or short ranges, depending on whether it's, you know, what power sources around, what vessels are needing what. It can just relay both of those um, back around. Uh, it's also a shipyard um, on the back there, so we can produce some pretty big ships here. Uh, Anti-gravity, uh, of course, a lot of fuel storage, centrifuge ring for producing all manner of things out of the materials that we collect both with that magnetic scoop that functions perfectly well out here uh, orbiting Ike. Um, also lack of atmosphere around Ike means that having the magnetic scoop open in orbit doesn't degrade our orbit which is super awesome. Um, and we can do some chemistry and some other things with the materials that we collect with that solar wind. Um, processing them uh, using the refrigerator unit attached to the vessel that we just docked. 
I save a lot of mass on I know it doesn't look like I save a lot of mass on stations, but when I'm piling so much stuff on stations, I do try to cut corners where I can. So uh, with this station, there isn't a refinery um, in the traditional sense. There's a fabricator, and then there's the rings, and there's an electrolyzer. Um, so most of my vessels have refrigerators on them, so docking vessels will dock to this and provide refrigerator functions when needed. Uh, generally when they're delivering or picking up fuel is when that refrigerator is going to be needed, so they'll just bring their own. Um, other than that, um, the electrolyzer and the converter can do a lot of other operations, and then the centrifuge ring can, you know, produce all manner of things. Um, I can even make antimatter and positron, or, um, positrons using power beamed in, and then I can recharge the batteries, if you will. Um, so it can just kind of hang out here and just get deliveries and, you know, trade stuff off and, you know, f serve as a hub around Duna and a shipyard for constructing um, other bases. So um, this, in, in later episodes, once we get this thing all filled up, this shipyard uh, will produce a ship that will land and construct bases and those bases will then produce lots and lots of rocket parts and fuels so that they can produce more shipyards that will go to other planets and do the same thing and basically it'll be shipyards building ships that build bases that build shipyards that build ships that build bases that build shipyards that build ships that build bases and so on and so forth until my computer vomits due to the number of vessels that i have orbiting just want to see how big I can get it. So we'll, we'll base the Kerbal Shed scale, <laughs> as it were, on how much um, interstellar goodness I can get in orbit, transmitting power, and uh, we'll base it on how much like power plant I have, uh, like total power plant, um, you know, megajoules, megawatts, terawatt, petawatt <laughs> production I can manage, and my games still actually run. <laughs> so we'll see. And, oh yeah, those uh, antennas definitely, um, you know, they have a rotate function there. I can't quite figure out how to aim them properly, but um, I assume they just kind of do their little rotation function. I don't know if they auto-track when I actually have the network functioning. Um, I'll have to figure that out um, at some point. But the network's not um, on right now because we're being blocked by Ike, and I need to get some, some relay satellites up. So that'll be, you know, another goal is for this thing to build a fleet of relays um, so that it can get power coverage at all times around the, uh, the Duna system. All right, um, that's pretty much it for this one. I've got a few more things planned for the next upcoming episodes, but this is more of an introduction. We're going to take all the things we learned um, and try to, you know, get... Uh, get good at the uh, the Kardashev thing. Um, so if you have any suggestions for things that I should do or try, uh, let me know in the comments. Send me a message on Discord. And other than that, have a great day. And keep flying, keep having fun.